So good afternoon. Welcome to the um, afternoon session of the conference. Um, so we, we will now be um, holding the quantum security session, a nice um, long marathon two-hour session. Um, so the session was originally to be chaired by Michele Mosca. Uh, unfortunately, Michele Mosca had to leave for a uh, medical emergency. Session instead. Uh, my name is David Zhao. I'm from the University of Waterloo. Um, and so, our first talk today uh, is uh, applying Grover's algorithm to AES quantum resource estimates by Grosser, Langenberg, Rutteller, and Steinbond. And um, Brandon Langenberg will be giving the talk. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, to uh, sorry. Uh, to our knowledge, there was no uh, quantum circuit for AES actually implemented out there. So um, that's uh, mostly what we did was create an AES circuit um, that now can be applied to Grover and just calculated all the resource um, estimates for that. Uh, we analyzed the quantum resources, including this overall circuit size, the number of qubits, and the circuit depth using the Clifford plus T gate set. And we did this for uh, all three versions of AES. Um, that are standardized in the, the FIPS Pub 197, um, if you want to uh, reference that um, for information. Um, through there, we found the, the resource estimates for each, uh, how to compute the, each round of AES, um, how to, uh, the resource estimates for the key expansion, um, and as well as applying this uh, to Grover's algorithm, uh, checking for uniqueness, and then finally having our, our total number of um, gates and circuit size and complexity uh, from there. So for the AES rounds, the internal state is treated um, as each point is 128 uh, bits or qubits um, are held in. You can kind of visualize a four by four um, array of each, I mean, each uh, byte is, uh, or each block is as a byte. Um, what happens in each uh, round of AES, the four following operations are applied. Um, Subbytes, uh, which affects each byte one at a time. Um, and is the, the most costly of the ones that we had to implement. Um, so I'll spend most of my talk discussing that. Uh, shift rows, uh, which affects one, each row at a time. Mixed columns affects each column at a time. And then add round key um, is an overall, um, affects the overall state um, at one time. Um, so what subbytes actually does is it treats each byte as um, element, say, alpha in this finite field and finds its inverse and then applies this affine transformation um, at the very end, which kind of hides the, the inverse uh, part. Classical AES uh, can employ a lookup table. Um, to do something like this seemed very resource um, extensive. So what we actually did was um, explicitly calculated um, a alpha inverse each time. And in order to do that, we used uh, Ito Suji uh, inverter, I guess. Um, not multiplier, but inverter. Uh, alpha inverse in this field would be the same as alpha to the 254. Um, so we're applying these uh, calculations uh, here is a lot shorter than some square and multiply or some other kind of operation um, that we currently know of. Uh, the interesting part about this is all the, on the squares, the fourths, the sixteenths, and the sixty-fourths are all linear operations, um, which means they can be done in place and very cheaply and efficiently. The multiplications are what got um, expensive uh, when we went through. So if I go through and show how I calculated uh, or how we calculated uh, alpha uh, inverse uh, throughout the states. Um, you can kind of follow along. The first operation you would have to do is multiply alpha times alpha inverse to get alpha cubed. Um, that takes place on the first step, or I guess I should start with. We started, we needed, uh, the least we could do it in was 40 qubits. Um, the first eight holding the uh, current byte, and then the uh, remaining 32 anti uh, qubits for all of our computations. So the first step was uh, we could square um, alpha, and then the second step would be multiply alpha times alpha squared to get alpha cubed. Um, we uh, took alpha cubed, raised it to the fourth power to get alpha to the twelfth, and then alpha to the twelfth times alpha cubed gave us alpha fifteenth. At that point, all the uh, qubits were basically in storage, but we could uh, do a reverse multiplication to remove alpha cubed, and then continue on the process like this until we got all the way to, uh, I guess, uh, level 11, which actually was the first uh, calculates alpha to the 254. Um, that gave us uh, alpha inverse. But again, if you notice, we have 24 qubits with storage on them. 
So we sort of did this uh, whole process more or less in reverse to clean up uh, the remaining qubits, leaving these uh, 24 qubits um, actually reinitialized. Uh, to go through, just to, to mention, obviously, the, the, uh, hopefully, obviously, the red represents the actual operation that um, was affected. The star represents uh, the multiplications that took place. Um, in fact, uh, this uh, alpha inverse has, well, listed up here has six multiplications, but three of them are alpha cubed. So obviously, we didn't need to do that uh, three times. Uh, but the stars represent uh, the multiplication, which is actually eight times out of the 20. The rest of them are just those linear operations. So those are the two main types of operations. Uh, the squaring, the fourth, 16th, 64th, were all uh, similar in the fact that you can take alpha and multiply it, in this case, the squaring matrix um, here on the left. Um, but you can't do this matrix in place because it'll start changing uh, the values on the bits as you go. So um, if you wanted to just use this matrix, uh, what we'd have to implement is what's list, uh, listed right below it. Uh, if alpha stored on the first eight qubits, uh, then you do the uh, multiplication, and this operation would give you alpha squared on the eight qubits uh, wherever you wanted to put the store the alpha squared. The other operation or the other option is to do a uh, what we did was a LUP decomposition, which breaks um, this matrix into uh, or technically I guess an upper, a lower, and then a permutation matrix um, from right to left. And then you're able to actually implement uh, this square in place, which is listed um, below that here. And you can even see these are uh, CNOT gates. Um, you can see the first operations are the upper uh, matrix, upper triangular matrix, the lower triangular matrix. And then if you notice on the very right-hand side, the qubits are out of order now. Um, that's uh, instead of actually implementing some kind of swap gate, we just uh, kept track of the qubits as we went and just read them off in a different order and it didn't affect, you didn't use any uh, more gates to do that. Um, so either one of these, actually we used both of these depending on what they were needed. Um, they actually, in this case, alpha squared used less gates uh, to square it in place, but for fourth and 16th, it was slightly more. But either way, keep track, this is 12, and I believe this was 20 um, total C naught gates. When we get to the multiplication, um, you'll see the, the difference in the extensiveness of the multiplication. Uh, we used uh, Maslow's design, uh, which saves us uh, on qubits. Um, this is the, the circuit for the multiplication. Actually, in the middle here is another uh, LUP decomposition that we had to do. I'm um, here. These uh, on the left and the right are the Toffoli gates that are used for multiplication. There's 64 of them in total, and then 21 CNOT gates in the middle um, for a total of 448 uh, T gates, if you break down the Toffoli's, and 533 uh, Clifford gates. Again, that's just for one multiplication versus the uh, 12 or 20 for the uh, linear square and fourth powers. Uh, again, this was happened eight times uh, per inverse, so we had to do this in total uh, eight times. Um, throughout the subbytes, the multiplication is the only thing that uses uh, these T gates, which um, are they're very expensive gates and compared to the uh, C naught gates and the not gates. Um, so we'll see uh, as we go through the, the whole thing, but the, the T gates are, uh, keep in mind, the ones we try to reduce as much as possible. And then the Clifford gates um, are, most of that, or this is off the multiplication and we'll see that uh, as we go through to calculate the whole um, inverse, this multiplication is most of it. The, the final operation of the subbytes is this, like I said, this affine transformation, which is simply this standard uh, matrix here. You multiply uh, whatever, uh, this would be alpha inverse, uh, by this matrix, and then just uh, add this uh, final vector. This matrix uh, can be computed uh, in place using the LUP decomposition, and then uh, four bits are flipped um, at the end to comp compute this vector. So what that gives you at the very end of uh, your, your subbytes operation is uh, in order to compute uh, one uh, round of this, it's the 3,584 T gates, which again comes from all the multiplication and uh, 4,569 Clifford gates. If you recall, the other number uh, was uh, 4,200 and something of those was just from the multiplications. Um, alone again, so about 300 uh, total gates were these uh, LUP decompositions, these linear um, operations to go through. 
Um, and again, this is to find uh, one inverse in the, the affine transformation, or one S-box. And so again, it was a 4 by 4 array, 128 bits. So this has to happen 16 times per round. Uh, excuse me. So then the, the next operation after subbytes that AES employs or uh, um, uses is shift rows. This is a simple uh, permutation or shift of the first row, nothing. The second row, you shift everything to the left by 8 bits, the second row by 16 bits, and the third row by 24 uh, bits. Again, this is just a permutation, so we actually got this for free. Um, didn't really need to implement anything. It's just keeping track of what's happening as you go. Um, just where the actual uh, byte is now, um, where it should be and where it is, is just a uh, simple keeping track. Uh, the next operation for AES uh, is this mixed columns, which affects an entire uh, column or 32 bits uh, at one time. It uses this, uh, this is a 32 by 32 matrix. Um, what it is, each one of these numbers, the 0, 1 represents an, the 8 by 8 identity matrix, the 0, 2 represents this 8 by 8 matrix, and 0, 3 is represented uh, by this matrix here. Putting that all together makes this a big 32 by 32 matrix. Again, that's just a linear operation which we can compute with the LUP decomposition. Uh, computing it in place uh, required 277 CNOT gates, which took a total uh, depth of 39. Uh, again, depth is uh, how many times um, cycles it would take to complete. complete. Uh, here's an example of the uh, mixed columns operation uh, with the LUP decomposition. Again, you could see the, the upper part at the beginning, the, the lower part at the end. And at the very end, I, I did leave in uh, for this slide the, like the, the swap gates, which we actually obviously didn't implement, but just so you can kind of see uh, what's actually happening. Again, instead of implementing the permutation, you just keep track of the, the qubits where they're at or where they should be, and you're fine. All right. So from there, the final part of each round is a, an XOR of the current state with, a, um, with the, the round key um, for that part, which is a, as simple as XORing every single bit with, uh, of the current state with every single bit of the round key. Um, that's just, uh, in general, 128 CNOT gates can all be done at the same time. Um, so again, not very expensive to Produce, but in order to uh, get this uh, round key each time, you have to use uh, the key expansion. And so what the, the key expansion uh, does, so again, AES-128 represents the, the key length, 128-bit uh, key, 192-bit key, and a 256-bit key. Uh, treating each of those uh, 32 bits as a word, um, so four words for AES-128. Um, the following four operations are applied um, to produce new words, but actually not all of these are applied every time. In fact, uh, three-fourths of the time for AES-128 and 256, uh, this XORing of previous keys to create a new key is all that's used. Um, and five-sixths of the time in AES-192, uh, this XORing is all that's used. Um, only a fourth of the time and a sixth of the time is this, uh, the subwords, which um, is basically, again, just subbytes four times, uh, is used, again, only a fourth of the time or a sixth of the time. And so, again, that uh, being so costly, we stored those values. And the other values, when we needed them, the other uh, 75 or uh, five, six of the words we just computed, um, used, and then removed to save qubits and didn't actually store all that and uh, use all that space as we went. So, again, uh, yeah, rotates words is uh, the same idea. Um, Bit wasn't it costly? Uh, the archon is just a, a, a one to two bit flip on of all 32 bits, and then the XORing uh, combining previous words together to do an operation to create a new word. Uh, what happens is you take, for example, AES uh, 128. You start with four words or 128 bits and expand that into 44 words. Only 10 of those used subwords. So only 10 of those were actually uh, stored. For AES-192, uh, you went from six words to 52 words. Only eight of those are, are uh, used subwords, because again, it's every sixth time. And then AES-256, uh, we stored 13 of the total 60 words, um, along with the original key as well. That uh, gave us some numbers here. Again, this represents the, the gates that we used, uh, the not, C not, and Toffoli gates, uh, are breaking uh, that down into the depth, the depth um, you can look at the T-depth or the overall depth, and then the storage and the SLI, the extra qubits, 
uh, used to compute that. Again, notice the, the 192, the actual um, total number of gates and depth and storage at this point is less because of the um, only using the subbytes every sixth word. We didn't have to store or compute as much uh, from that. This picture is an example of um, actually uh, both of those, those two different types of words. Either the words are just XORed um, from previous words, or they're used, uh, the subbytes and all those operations. So here in AES 128, um, suppose we have uh, the first four words stored on these qubits, the first 128 bits or qubits. Uh, and then suppose we already computed word four. If we wanted to compute word seven by the, the publication standards, uh, word seven uses word six and word three, XOR together, but we don't have word six. But word six was word five and word two. We don't have word five, but word four, uh, five was word four and word one. So replacing all that, substituting all that back in, you can compute word seven uh, just by XORing these four words together. So again, that's just a, a total of 128 XORs. Uh, in fact, we, you can uh, compute it right on top of word four and only use uh, 96 uh, XORs to produce word seven if you need it. Um, so that's an example of how to produce word seven. Word eight needed um, word seven and word four. So you could uh, compute word seven right on top of word four and then uh, apply the, the reason these are different is the first operation is that uh, that uh, shift rows, a uh, rotate word. Uh, then you apply uh, subbytes. Um, this notation listed here is where the information came from, where the, the output was stored, and then the uh, ancilla qubits that were used. And then the, the archon is just the, the one or two bit flip. Uh, and then that, at that point, in order to XOR word four on top of this, you had to remove word seven um, by just doing the same XOR, flipping the bits twice now to remove it. Uh, now XORing word four on top of uh, what you have gives you word eight. And so at this point, now you'd have words zero, one, two, three, you'd computed word four, um, and then you have word eight. So the same thing happens every fourth word as you go. Uh, the, the general outline of the, the whole system looked something like this uh, with the key expansion. So again, this would list AES 192. Every sixth word is stored. Uh, with the original words here. Uh, computing the rounds as we went, again, the, the subbytes was the uh, operation that could not be done in place. So each uh, round, it employed an extra 128 uh, qubits, which uh, starts to get expensive if you have to do, uh, in this case, 12 rounds of AES for 192, 14 rounds for 256, and so forth. So what we actually did was we implemented a, a cleanup, just a reverse uh, at certain stages. Uh, and this time we did it twice. Uh, to save qubits at, for AES-182, that means we only used a total of a little over a thousand qubits to compute our final result, um, which would have our, our output there would be our, our final result of the AES-192, listing the number of gates and the depth of these is here. The number on the, the very bottom right is, for example, AES-128, this 856 is the total qubits for the key generation and the 10 rounds, and then plus the 128 for the initial key. Um, and you'll see the, the numbers listed here, which uh, how many gates and the depth to produce each of these three operations, or these three AESs. Uh, from there, now we have a, a working uh, version of AES to implement. So we applied this into Grover's algorithm, uh, which says you need to, uh, uh, apply Grover's algorithm about the square root of n times, uh, specifically this number, pi over four times the square root of n or two to the k. Um, number of times, we didn't add anything uh, to Grover's algorithm, so we just implemented it the exact way that it's specified um, in his paper and went from there. Uh, but in order to uh, find those, uh, to check for uniqueness, we used a heuristic argument that uh, suggested we should uh, do this uh, three times for AES-128, uh, four times for AES-192, and five times for AES-256 um, to be more sure of having the, the correct key uh, as we go through. So gave us our results there. And then finally, uh, we have our, our total number of 
uh, gates and circuit sizes and stuff to actually estimate a Grover attack on AES. So implementing AES that many times gave us these numbers with these specific number of qubits and gates and complexity. So that's it. All right, do we have any questions? Um, no, uh, I mean, we, we, we used, um, read the paper that said uh, to do it this way. Um, and, and this, I, I think, as, as far as I'm aware, this actual multiplication is, is as good as I know. But in order to implement it, this way is just the, the best that I could do. For example, this shows six multiplications uh, to compute that, but we didn't actually use six multiplications to get the result. Um, in fact, I used uh, one, two, three, four, five multiplications. But in fact, uh, one of those multiplications was a reverse multiplication just to, to clean up uh, uh, space. The first time we did this, I just used as many you know, qubits as I would need and didn't remove anything. And then we went back and tried to do it with less and less and less uh, to see where we're at. But absolutely, I think uh, there, there could be a reason for reduction um, for any of these in the way. But it, at the result we had, we felt this was uh, somewhat decent, um, but obviously it could be optimized more. We focused on simplifying the multiplications in the qubits uh, from there. Somebody. Thank you. Mind if I ask a devil's advocate question? Uh oh. Um, you mentioned that uh, the time that it would take to break AES 128 is about two to the 86th time, and because of that, you would, you advise people to move away from 128-bit keys. Now, if you're on a, if this can be run on a single processor, no single processor can possibly do two to 86 operations in any conceivable amount of time. Correct. Uh, why do you think that this is actually feasible? Um, well, in the opera. Uh and the construction that we did, obviously, yes, uh, it, it seems uh, very uh, more costly than the two to the 60 that you could go through. But again, we're not very guaranteeing or there's no proof that this is optimal. Um, and going through this, if you're able to reduce uh, the circuit size or um, simplify this process, these numbers will start falling down. But according to uh, Grover's algorithm, you know, the best you could do is the square root of n. Uh, we have an example of what could happen, showing that those numbers are more or less in reach of the numbers that we have. So if anybody comes through and takes this work and reduces this down even further, then you'd get closer to that, that 2 to the 60, 2 to the 64 mark, which um, is an is a issue. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank Brandon again.